morning, Elwood First. Good morning. It is good to be here with you all today, and with those of you who are online, we want to encourage you to check in with us. Uh, let us know you're there with a, a little uh, check mark or smiley face, or just say good morning to us. We always welcome hearing from you, uh, either through your Facebook or YouTube comments, or reach out to us in the office. We would love to, to have, uh, have that touch with you. I want to uh, offer a few announcements before we begin our worship service. First, on Wednesday, a couple things that were not in the bulletin. At 5.30, if you were in the SPRC, we're going to have a meeting. If you don't know what the SPRC is, you're not on the team. Or, or if Spark, if you know what Spark is, we are meeting Wednesday at 5.30. And then the ad board is meeting at 6 o'clock. So hope to see you there if you're on either of those teams. A few of you have been looking for the Upper Room devotionals. We have been trying to track that down for over a week now. We're not sure what's going on. We can't get through on the phone. We're not hearing back on email. So we're trying to get us some upper room devotionals. So thank you for your patience while we're working with communicating with that, uh, with that ministry. I want to encourage you to note that in the back of your bulletin is our Holy Week schedule. And I also have it printed out. There are handouts on the back table, the credenza, our coffee table. As you're inviting people to our worship services this month, as you're thinking about inviting folks to Easter or anything happening on Holy Week, I went ahead and made copies of this. So you have that available. You can grab some of those and take with you in order to share with other folks uh, about what's going on. We're also collecting mini candies that will fit inside Easter eggs. We don't need the Easter eggs. We already have those. I believe, yes, we have the eggs, but we do need the mini candies. If anybody wants to donate, you can put them in the green tub that's in the back of the sanctuary. If you donated and you're wondering why it's not in the tub, I've already pulled those out. So we do have those. Thank you very much for those donations. Um, also want to celebrate um, our bowling social that we had a couple weeks ago. We have a few pictures that we were going to share with you. Uh, just if you were there and you can enjoy those, or if you missed it, you can just get a little glimpse of what that looked like. We had bowlers of all ages or people just hanging out and talking and eating. Even people who are non-bowlers who still bowled like myself. And I have to brag that I got better than 50% non-gutter balls, I think. <laughs> It was about that close, uh, but it was just fun getting to meet some new people from, from family members, from friends who you all invited to come, and having that opportunity to just be together playing as a family together. We're going to begin our worship now. As we... All right. What up? Okay. All right. Well, we can scooch over. Okay, so what do you think these two... Oh, first of all, do you kind of know what that is? That's uh, a cane. It's not supposed to be a cane. Uh, it's a stick. It's a stick, but we use it at Live Nativity. Who carries these at Live Nativity? Uh, um, nope. This is what our shepherd carries. Because this is a, supposed to be a shepherd's crook. And that's how they would have made them back then. They probably didn't have, we have a fancy one. But that's a shepherd's crook. Yep, it's coming apart. And a crown. So why would we have a shepherd's hook and a crown? What did these have in common? Any idea? Any idea? No? Well, we heard about them last week. So there is a king who was a shepherd. And his name was David. And he's pretty famous. You guys know David and Goliath? You know that story? No? Okay, well, we'll work on that in Sunday school. But David and Goliath, that's the David we talk about. And he was a shepherd. And the shepherd uses their crook to get sheep out of places because sheep really aren't all that smart. They do really silly things sometimes. Like, they'll, if they're walking along and one of the sheep jumps, all of the sheep will jump right at the same spot. For no reason, they'll just jump. I see you have Barbie shoes. That's, well, we won't go there. Um, <laughs> but, so she, you do. I like your, you've got horses on yours. Now, horses are pretty smart, but sheep are not all that smart. They do silly things. Did you know that sheep will run themselves to death? They will run until they die. We, my grandfather was a farmer, and he had sheep, and they, if the dogs got out, they'd just run and run and run. That's why a shepherd... 
<laughs> well, they'd faint. And that's why they have these things, is because sheep are silly and they get themselves into places that they can't get out of. They grab them and pull them out with it. Now, when you go from being a shepherd to being a king, I think people can do just about as silly as things as sheep sometimes, can't we? So sometimes I know people who will say bad things about somebody just because somebody else said something bad. We call that gossip. Or if they say it to their face, we call them bullies, right? Um, sometimes we do bad things to ourselves, don't we? People who abuse drugs or smoke and drink too much, all of those kinds of things. So that's why a king has a responsibility to take care of us. So that's what David did. He took care of most of his people. Now, there's another king. He wasn't really a shepherd, but we call him a shepherd a lot. Do you know the other king I'm talking about? No. 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 Well, who do we usually talk about here? I do. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the shepherd. Yeah, I know. We do, don't we? Jesus is our shepherd, and we hear a lot about Jesus being a shepherd, and that's because I think we're kind of like sheep a lot of times. We do silly things to ourselves, and we do silly things to other people, and Jesus came to save us from ourselves. So we give him a crown, but his crown is a crown of thorns, isn't it? It's not a pretty... I wouldn't mind wearing this crown. I don't think I'd want to wear his crown. Come on, put it on. No, <laughs> I'll let you put it on. How's that? No, no, no. no, no. Okay. That. All right. Well, the reason we like Jesus to care for us is because he sees each one of us individually, and he cares about what happens to each of us, okay? All right. Pray with me, and, I, and you actually, you get to choose what you want today. So, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending us your son who loves us so much that he sees each of us and he understands the pain that we suffer and he wants the best for us. So help us follow him because he will never lead us astray like so many people that we know would. He loves us. He loves us every single day. So thank you for his presence and we pray that we can have the fortitude and energy to follow where he leads. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. Who wants to get the ba basket over there? I do it. All right. Bring it on over. Pastor Wynn gave you guys these things. So you have your choice because God sees us. Jesus sees us. You can have sunglasses or because Jesus was the king, you can have a crown. No. You want sunglasses? Yeah. yeah. All right. We got blue, yellow. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, you no, you can't have books. You can't have both sunglasses because your brother doesn't have one yet. You want a crown instead of sunglasses? All right. No. No. Okay. Thank you. Come to a time of prayer now, an opportunity for us together as part of the body of Christ to talk with God. And as we begin, I want to see if you uh, would like to lift up any joys or concerns that you would like to share with your brothers or sisters here today. Uh, you all know the Hunsinger family. My Uncle Danny lost his grandson yesterday down in North Carolina. He was only 18 years old, and this family has been tragically, tragically been hit really hard with losing their, losing Jennifer, both parents basically, and now their son. So please keep the family in North Carolina, Danny Hunsinger, and the rest of them in your prayers because this is really hard and it's very sad. So I just want the church to be praying for the family. They don't know what happened. We're waiting for the reports. As soon as I find out, I will. I have a joy today. I've asked you this church many times to pray for J.J. Hobbs, who's Julie and Larry's grandson, the little boy who has the, the birth defect. And his life expectancy was probably four. And last week, he turned six. Yeah, one up here. I can speak loud if you want to. The people at home can't hear you, though. 
I have a friend named Amy Hiddle, and she has many health problems, and I'd like them to pray for her, please. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, you have created all things and created them and called them good. And what you have made in this world is beautiful. And God, we long for that to be all that we see. We long for a vision of seeing the beauty of your works before us and in us and in our loved ones. And so much of our vision, God, is filled by pain and suffering, by struggles in our bodies and our minds, brokenness and illness in our loved ones, conflict in our country and in nations around the world. God, this can take up all of our attention and still us of the strength and hope that you have given us. As we have lifted these names up to you, God, we ask that you hear them that you envelop these families in your loving embrace, that they may feel held by you through their difficult circumstances. Give us also, God, some sense of how we can be present for those who are suffering in our lives, that we may be a source of peace and comfort, that if we are the ones who carry the hope in the world, we may help them to find their hope restored. We pray, God, that we are standing on that solid ground, that foundation for us that is Jesus Christ, who helps us to maintain our hope in troubled times that we are in. God, guide us with the energy and the strength and the courage that you provide to continue to walking through our lives that seems to have so many obstacles, so much heartbreak. In you, God, we trust to deliver us. And God, we know that even as we endure situations that feel overwhelming to us, you will bear us up. You will bring us back at last into your presence. And as we walk, God, help us to fill your presence every step of the way so that our faith in you may be rewarded with the promises that you provide. That we may have a sense of being able to see the world with your eyes and pour out your love in what we see. Let us realize that all, everyone we know, is a brother and sister to us, your precious and beloved sons and daughters that are part of our family. For the names we have not lifted up, God, you know what is on our minds and in our hearts. And we thank you for being with us, whatever it is we bring, and for giving us the Christ in whose name we pray and in whose words we pray as we join our voices together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Psalm 110. The Lord says to my uh, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at the right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends out from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your foes. Your people will offer themselves willingly on the day you lead your forces on the holy mountains. From the womb of the morning, like dew, your youth will come to you. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Malahizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter heads over the wide earth. He will drink from the stream by the path. Therefore, he will lift, you, he will lift up his head. The word of our God for the people of God. So we're continuing our series on finding Jesus, searching for him through the Psalms. And today, we're going to find him. We're going to find him as our source of hope. We're looking through the eyes of King David, who we know was the greatest king that Israel ever knew. But even in the glory of his kingdom, David had just enough wisdom to know that things could be better, that there were struggles in the world, in the kingdom. And he had just enough prophecy in him, just enough vision to know that there was something beyond what was, something yet to come that was even greater. Let us pray. Holy God, as we explore your word for us this day, help us to hear the words of David singing to us across the ages of a hope for the Messiah that he longed for and the Messiah that is ours. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. So the collection of Psalms that we've been sitting with is the longest book in the Bible, and it has the most contributors to it. We're focusing on King David's writings. After him, King Solomon continued the tradition and wrote Psalms. There were also a lot of priests, Levites, which were a particular order of priests and their families, wrote many Psalms. And even Moses wrote a Psalm that we have from him. All of them offer experiences that they had of God. They offer their perspective and their understanding of life as a chosen people set apart by God. And it's usually for the purpose of a group getting together for worship. So it's very appropriate that we're sitting with the Psalms in a time of worship together. That's what they're intended for. And there's a lot of words of hope. There are a lot of words of hope in the Psalms for us to find, inviting us to sing the song, to lift up praises to God that convey our deepest emotions, whatever it is we're feeling. There's hope found in poetry and prayer. These songs bound the people to God under his lordship in their lives and led them to participate in God's word in in such a way that other texts just didn't tap into because the Psalms will stir up emotions in us beyond the limits of the language. When we ourselves think about hope, what that is, what it means to us, it's going to differ for different people. It might mean that um, that you trust in something or that you're expectant for something. Our hope might be a confidence that a particular outcome or event will will happen. There is anticipation and longing. There is desire for a fulfillment of maybe a wish or a dream, or for us, a prayer that we lift up. Or for you, what you think hope is, it might be that you have a reliance on someone or something. We're going to look at two different approaches that David takes in his psalms. And so we're going to look at two different psalms. We're going to focus on one, but then we're going to come around to another to look at how he has found hope and express that in his writing. So our scripture for the day is Psalm 110 that you just heard read. It offers a word of hope yet to come, a word of hope for what is going to come to pass but hasn't yet come to pass. It tells us that God is going to be victorious in and over the world, that that's a guarantee for us that he will have victory and reclaim his creation and redeem it and heal and restore all things. Psalm 110 is the most often quoted psalm in all of the New Testament. Over 20 references are made to this psalm. And many who wrote, many who spoke and were captured in the times of the New Testament found Jesus in this psalm. As you were hearing it read, did you hear anything about Jesus in there? Does it feel like a reach? Hmm. 
<laughs> We're meant to see this psalm pointing to Jesus ourselves. Even Jesus claimed his identity in it. But now that we're a few psalms into our study, it's okay to continue to be skeptical, to have some skepticism about these ancient prophecies from thousands and thousands of years ago. But our advantage is that we come into this word after so many prophecies have already been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. We have this advantage of being able to see it in hindsight. Jews and other God-fearers throughout the ages, though, they didn't have a contemporary Messiah to point to. They were still waiting for his arrival, still longing, still hoping for a Messiah that hadn't yet come. This messianic psalm, as it's called, this messianic psalm of David, it seems like a bit of a head-scratcher for us to try to figure out, even though so many disciples and apostles saw it clearly. When we read the scripture, it seems like David is talking about someone or hearing a conversation between God and someone else and transcribing it into words for us to read. In the New Testament, Jesus does confirm that David wrote this psalm, but for us, the challenge is trying to see that David was pointing to Jesus in his writing. It begins with this. The Lord says to my Lord. At first glance, it almost seems like someone is talking to himself in this passage. And if you haven't ever thought about Jesus, who is God, talking with his heavenly Father, who is God... Now is a good time to think about that. How does that work? Because isn't God God? How is God talking to himself? But we're going to look at this. The Lord says to my Lord, you've got these two words here. And Beverly Austin might have made a mistake of telling me an idea that she had. <laughs> so whoever's in my, ah, oh, she really didn't have this idea. Maybe it was more of a worry that they had homework. So whoever was in my Wednesday class, can you tell me what either of those words are? Fantastic. <laughs> she can tell us what the letters are. Fantastic. No, we did not specifically learn these words, so I would not expect you to know them. But the words translated in our English translation as Lord and Lord are actually two different Hebrew words. And in Hebrew, if you're who's left-handed like I am? Any left hand? <gasps> what? No one's going to admit it. Thank you, Drake. Drake's got my back. Drake, this language is for us because Hebrew is read from the right side to the left. So it's oriented differently. So as you're looking at this word, you actually start on the right side and work your way to the left. But the first word that we have is the Lord. We can think of it as a proper name or proper noun, a name that we have. David is talking here about Yahweh. This word, that first one is Yahweh, the name God gave for us, refers to him. That refers to him. It wasn't really a word. It is four consonants that are really more like a breath. It's rep I should say it's represented in four consonants. What it was Moses heard, the Yahweh that the people used, is more of a breath than a word. When Moses was just meeting his God, the Lord Yahweh, who was commanding him to take the Hebrew people who were enslaved in Egypt out. Moses demanded a name. He's like, I got to know who's sending me. I have to have a name. And this is the name that God gave him, the name and title that his people were to use for him for all time. God said, I am Yahweh. So this is God speaking. It's not David. Like all prophets, David is working to capture the words of God, not his own voice in this psalm. The second word up there is how we have, we, we've translated it as my Lord. This word is Adoni, or Adon, Adoni, and it could be referring to any number of different lords. It could actually be referring to God. It has been used to talk about God. The full word used in Psalm 10 is Ladoni. La means my, the my Lord that they're talking about. But it could be a human master or authority figure. It could actually be Jesus if it's pointing forward indeed to talk about Jesus. But it doesn't necessarily mean divine. It could just be Jesus was this wonderful teacher, not of equal stature with God, but someone who gave us wisdom, who imparted wisdom on us, but not somebody who holds our lives. So that word can mean a lot of different things. But there were a few New Testament writers, Peter, Paul, the, other, the writer of Hebrews, they all wrote to verify that this Lord, my Lord, specifically refers to to Jesus the Messiah. So we're going to compare. 
when we look at the scripture, we're going to look at how this Psalm 110, which we'll have up, is going to compare with the story of Jesus. So we're going to go back to that Psalm. I'll have Drake put that back up there. It says, the Lord says to my Lord, the Lord Yahweh says to my Lord, Adonai, Adonai, that word might be familiar to you. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. We know when Jesus sacrificed himself for all, he ascended to heaven. By God's word, it was to sit at God's right hand as he reigns until he humbles all of his enemies. Anyone who rejects Christ will be beneath his feet. Then the Lord there, that second one, well, the third one, I guess, our second sentence, the Lord... Yahweh sends out from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your foes. The will of God took place in Jerusalem. That's where Jesus' ministry began. That's where he was sacrificed to death and where he rose again and began to appear. And Zion was actually a place that was on one of the hills that became ancient Jerusalem. So this is the origin of this work, both in the Word and the Psalm and in the Gospel message that we have from Jesus. And Jesus will have authority over all the nations. Your people will offer themselves willingly on the day that you lead, your forces on the holy mountains. From the womb of the morning like dew, your youth will come to you. For Jesus, by his work... Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. When we think about what that means, we know that it's bowing down in humility or in obedience to our Lord and confessing to sin in order to seek reconciliation with God, confessing to Christ as our Lord. And for those who believe that's who Jesus is, Jesus has authority over all of us, over the lives of every person, and we're accountable as those who follow him to his command shaping what it is we believe, shaping how it is we live our lives, again, if we're obedient. And this truth is not meant to be a burden. We think about the youth and the dew of the morning. It's meant to be new life for us and our source of hope. The Lord, first, or the third line, that first Lord there, that's again Yahweh. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. And here God is talking to Jesus. To, Sorry, he's talking to the my Lord again, the Adonai. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, it doesn't matter. You know, there's, I learned, I learned, for example, in, when, in learning a lot of scripture, in particular Greek, my teacher was Texan and German, so I never know how my pronunciation is. It could be any number of ways. So this word here is God continuing to talk to my Lord Adonai. David is again sharing a word that is spoken by God himself. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. God wants us to know this. For the Jews, in their history, there was the normal order of priests, the Levites. I mentioned that word earlier. The Levites worked very hard, but they could not accomplish the fullness and totality of God's great work of reconciliation of his people. They offered rituals and sacrifices throughout the year. In particular, there was an annual observance, a work they did, they, a work they did of redemption with God to, to make the people right with God again. Except their work was temporary. It didn't last, and they had to repeat it every single year. In Genesis 14, we first get to see the name Melchizedek. Do you all remember that from reading Genesis 14? No, we don't expect you to. But this is a priest, not he's a king, and he's a priest of the Most High God, a priest of a different order than the Levites that came from the Israel people. We look at the New Testament then, and pointing forward as the people share the good news of Jesus Christ, Hebrews teaches us about this king so that we can learn a little bit more, how this king was supposed to be a signpost to Christ himself. And it quotes the Psalm 110 in Hebrews. It says, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In explanation of who Jesus is, the author of Hebrews has this to write. We have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered 
having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This King Melchizedek of Salem, priest of the God Most High, met Abraham as he was returning from defeating the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned one-tenth of everything. His name in the first place means king of righteousness. Next, he is also king of Salem, and that means he's the king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. See how great he is. Even Abraham the patriarch gave him a tenth of the spoils. This man who does not belong to their ancestry collected tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had received the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. If perfection had been attained through the Levitical priesthood, what further need would there have been to speak of another priest arising according to the order of Melchizedek? So this priestly king that is talked about by David in Psalm 110 is a king that brings justice and righteousness and peace. Salem is a direct connection to Jerusalem. Jerusalem means the city of peace where his reign begins. This king receives a tithe, something that is commanded for God and God alone to receive. Melchizedek is a mystery. He remains a mystery still to us today. A forever, a forever priest who resembles the Son of God, foreshadowing Jesus. And then when Jesus comes, he fulfills this role for the people, not annually, but for all time. We don't have to continue to bring altar sacrifices here to God because Jesus has done the work for us. Then the last part of this psalm moves from Yahweh, Lord, to Adonai. We look at the last word here. The Lord is at your right hand. This Lord goes back to Ladoni, my Lord, Adonai. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter heads over the white earth. He will drink from the stream by the path. Therefore, he will lift up his head." takes a little bit of a dark turn here. <laughs> Jesus is the king of kings and will conquer all other nations. He will conquer all other rulers. We've explored this a little bit already in our study of the Psalms. This Psalm also affirms the gospel connection to the 23rd Psalm. You got to hear a little bit about it again in the children's message. It connects the shepherd image with the gospel's shepherd king who separates the sheep from the goats in the judgment of the people's. King David's hope is in what the Lord, both God and Jesus, will accomplish. He envisions this Messiah in a position of righteousness equal to God, sorting out all who accept him from all who deny him. This Messiah, my Lord, will deliver protection, justice, victory. His reign will extend throughout Jerusalem again and beyond conquering his enemies. Here's our hope. All the opposition that we know now in our lives of faith, everything that troubles us as followers of Jesus, will be conquered. All the evil and the pain that the world heaps on us will be destroyed. The saving life and death and resurrection of Jesus will accomplish this for us. And in our second psalm that we're going to take a look at, David offers a word of hope that is our response to this, to God's promises that will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In Psalm 100, praises of thanksgiving are sung to the Lord Yahweh. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. David shares this praise as a prayer to God in light of the many blessings he has known, his witness that has been given to the people under God's rule. 
God has created all things, and all the earth and everything and everyone in it should worship God as a response to the blessings that God gave to all of us. It's a very different attitude than we found of the hope that is expressed by David in Psalm 110. Psalm 110 acknowledges this difficult and harsh and powerful work of God on our behalf. In it, there's awe and maybe a sense that God might be approached with fear and trembling because of his power and his victory. In Psalm 100, our hope is a celebration of the beauty of life that we have from God. It's the victory dance that comes after God has conquered all, after he has been victorious and the battle has been won. This is God's people offering themselves willingly under his lordship. When we look at both of these psalms together, they allude to the sin of the world that Jesus comes to destroy and the original blessing that is God's creation and his will for us that was in the beginning and ultimately will be now and forever for us to claim and praise. Psalm 100 is our hope now and yet to come. We can make a joyful noise when we see God's original blessing in the world today. If we have a mind to find Jesus, not only in the Psalms, but throughout our lives, he becomes evident pretty quickly. You can see him in all kinds of different ways. Chris and I were at the Indie Symphony this past weekend, and we got to hear this piece by um, a modern-day composer who said that it was written with an idea of going to church in mind. And as we listened to it, maybe because I've been steeped in the Psalms, I heard it as a psalm that contained both praise and lament, right where we find ourselves as we live these lives. As followers of Jesus who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, and whose return we still await in the brokenness of life and this world. I feel his presence in a quiet early morning. The sun breaking in right now is another way we can experience that. This past week, I've heard birds chirp. Birds chirp. It was before the time changed, and birds were chirping earlier than it seemed like they should be. Now it's going to make sense. But I think about that, that beauty of creation all around me. I see Jesus in the presence of your smiles, and you're, you're being here in worship with us every Sunday morning to worship God. Our hope in the kingdom of God is for today, and it's also for the days to come, because we still know heartbreak and hardship. Psalm 100 lets us rejoice in what is to come of the works of God ahead of us. I often find myself in prayer for others or with others, and I'm giving thanks to God before something has come to pass. Prayers of anticipation and celebration with faith that God will deliver. There is hope in that for what can come. And regardless of what the world ultimately delivers, Jesus can make our hope in the good that can be and that will be through him. He can make that the hope that we all abide in. Psalm 100 points us to that sweet day of amazing grace when we can make a joyful noise that we all again at last are in God's perfect and sweet presence, reunited with him through Jesus Christ. The day we worship with gladness because disease has been eradicated, bodies and relationships are restored, parents will no longer lose their children to death. The season will come when we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and at long last find peace and connection an end to all wars, to all mourning. We will give thanks to God that our tears are dried and our pain is gone and the former things have passed away. And we're going to make this psalm of praise and hope our prayer now as we join together to sing this psalm that's in our Psalter. I'm going to invite you to open up your hymnal to 821 as we respond to God with the hope that he longs for us to have. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the lands. 
Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord who made us is God. We are the Lord's. We are the people of God, the sheep of God's pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Give thanks and bless God's name, for the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God's faithfulness to all generations. When you sing it, I think you believe it. Yes? Yes. <laughs> I love that enthusiastic response. Fantastic. I want us all to go out from here offering that enthusiastic response, offering the hope that we have in us for a world that is in such desperate need of us, of, of that hope and what we have to speak of it. Again, I'll remind you that if you want to take a little information sheet or a few, if you want to invite folks to worship in the coming days, this has information about our Holy Week services um, with times on it so, and dates so people can know. You just hand that off to them. Those are in the back near the coffee pots for you to grab and go as you leave from here. And as you leave from here, remember the hope that is in all of us because we have Jesus Christ. And he sends us out knowing that we're supported and encouraged by our brothers and sisters and always accompanied by God, who is our Father in heaven, by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and by the Holy Spirit, who will walk with us and equip us every step of the way. Go in peace. Thank you.